Well, here we go. It's finally here. The biggest betting weekend of the year in horse racing has arrived. It's Breeders' Cup 2022. Uh, you are watching the Race Lens webinar previewing all the action. 14 Breeders' Cup races. We're going to get to a bunch of them. My name is Dan Torgman. I'm with America's Best Racing. And as always, I am joined by Christina Blacker from TVG. Also joined by NHC champion Scott Coles and super excited uh, to have this team back together. We've done this for a few years now. And if you followed these webinars, you get to see how powerful Race Lens is. And you've also benefited from, uh, I can distinctly remember, uh, each of us over the years dropping some long shots who have won, who have hit the board, and also some locks, uh, which you need locks. You need to single some horses uh, in some of these sequences if you like playing the pick fours and pick fives, because in other legs you'll obviously have to spread a little more. Uh, but let's talk about some sage advice before we get started and dig into these races. Christina, what would you say if, if for somebody who's, you know, they, they see these 14 races, there's a lot to, to, to absorb and to take in and to handicap. What's your best bit of advice for them? It's actually something that I picked up from one of my colleagues, uh, Rich Perloff, and that is not to forget about those rolling pick threes. We get really excited about the pick fours. You get excited about the pick fives. You know, you have those big guarantees in those pools. But I think as you go through the Breeders' Cup races, you end up feeling like you've made selections in all of them, but you feel more confident in some than others, right? When you find that horse that you're really confident in, find a rolling pick three right there, single that horse, and then get some coverage in the other legs. You'd be surprised at how big those can pay. So maybe don't overreach uh, on a pick four, pick five, or a pick six. Keep things a little simpler. Go with a pick three, maybe even a double here and there. If you've got strong opinions in back-to-back -back races, Scott, how about you? What's your sage advice for the, uh, for the viewers here? Yeah, that's great. And just to piggyback off that is just that you don't have to play every race. It, it's really tough to do. I'm terrible at it. I will play every race because you know, I'm a degenerate, but the it's tough and you gotta, you've just got to wait and save the bullets for the opinions you, you're the, you feel the strongest about. And again, I can't stress how tough it is, but find something else to do. Watch the races, pay attention, but find something else to do for parts of the card that you're not confident in and to kind of take your mind away from, oh, I, oh, I'm here. Might as well throw a couple hundred at this race and this race. And then pretty soon you're down a lot of your bankroll before you even get to the races you like. So pick your spots, take a look at the whole wagering menu. There are two day bets. There's one day bets. There's like the, like Christina said, rolling pick threes, there's doubles everywhere. I mean, there are so many opportunities. Know where your strongest opinions are and find the bets that fit them the best. It could be a, you could like, horses that end up matching up perfectly in one of the two-day bets or a perfect pick three where you play it heavy but just kind of have a plan ahead of time because if you just go into it with no plan and you just start firing away at every race unless you just hit everything it is a tough way to make money no shame in being a dg uh this is a generous <laughs> delight um a little bit of foreshadowing there on christina's uh big picks coming up here in a few moments before we jump into christina's first pick on the uh, two days of action. I do want to let you know, as you're looking at race lens here, following along with us, uh, you have an opportunity at this particular moment to get a 30% discount on all Equibase and race lens subscriptions. It's open to all customers. Just go to equibase.com, click on race lens, and then use promo code RLBC30. Easy to remember, Race Lens BC30. So RLBC30 for a 30% discount. And then for anyone um, who hasn't tried Race Lens before, you can get a month subscription for just a dollar using uh, promo code RLM1E. We'll circle back at the end, remind you of those promos, uh, because by the end of this, you will certainly want to have a Race Lens subscription. Um, let's kick it off with Friday, Future Stars Friday at the Breeders' Cup at Keeneland. Race eight is the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies Turf. Uh, this is one of the interesting turf races where uh, U.S.-based horses have actually done really, really well. Um, 
I don't know if we say they've dominated the race, but not that many Europeans have won since 2013. Only two winning European horses in this race. Uh, Christina, I, I did do a little foreshadowing, so I hope I didn't totally blow up your spot, but you're going to start off with uh, some reasoning for a couple of horses that you actually don't like in this race. Yeah, so what you're kind of touching on there with the Euros versus the Americans, I think there's some races where you want to lean on the Europeans or somewhere you want to maybe look for an American horse. And I think that both Meditate and Midnight Mile are going to take a lot of money in this race. If you YouTube their replays, they look visually very impressive. They're both Europeans, one from Richard Fahey's barn, one from Aiden O'Brien's. But they're both by No Nay Never, who you might remember was a horse that Wesley Ward trained here in the States. He was a sprinter. I was just curious as to how his offspring do going the mile or farther, going long, going the route of ground. Not very well so far with the two-year-olds. So take a look. These are the numbers. He's just one for 19 with two-year-olds in turf routes, 5% winners. So for me, coming into the race where I know Meditate and Midnight Mile are going to take a lot of money, I certainly respect them. I like their form. I like what we've seen, but I'm not as confident that they can get the distance. So for that reason, I started to look at some American horses. The Nine Horse Delight is a horse I really like. Let's take a look at the replay of her last race, and we can kind of just pick it up from the, the quarter pole home in the Jessamine. She was able to get away with some pretty easy fractions. She went 24 and one. She went 49 and three, 114 and three for the three quarters. She's out there on the front end in those silks of Augustine Stables. And as you'll see, once they uh, turn for home, she's going to kick clear and really burst away from this field. She should have off of fractions like that. I like what we see from her. I think she is a filly that's improving right now. She's a daughter of Mendelssohn. He was a Breeders' Cup juvenile winner himself. I don't have any concern, obviously, about the distance for her because she's already done it here at Keeneland. But she did have a pretty good trip. She was able to hold the rail. She was able to you know, carve out those good fractions. I see her as definitely one of those horses you can put on top. She's a horse I'm very interested in. And I also took a closer look at some of these statistics for her trainer, Jonathan Thomas. We talk a lot about Michael McCarthy having been an assistant to Todd Pletcher. Well, Jonathan Thomas worked for Todd Pletcher as well for a long time. And he also worked for JJ Pletcher for Todd's father at his farm in Ocala. He does pretty well with limited starters. He doesn't have as big of a barn yet, but two-year-olds in graded stakes, two for seven so far, 29% winners, 43% in the money. I have faith in this barn. The other horse I wanted to just touch on real quick is the five horse Pleasant Passage. You know, Shook McGahee doesn't win that often first time out. Take a look at that first running line. He, he asked her to go the route at Saratoga first time out, and she was able to get up for the win. That, to me, already says a lot about her class. Her second career start was in the Miss Grillo. Just take a look at that condition, a yielding course that day. Again, she's able to get the win, and I think some of the others that are going to come back and take her on again use that track, the yielding turf course, as a bit of an excuse for a poor performance. I just like the fact that this filly kind of has no excuses. She's handled two tough scenarios in her first two starts very, very well. She has the strongest late pace figure in this field. So those two Americans, Pleasant Passage and Delight, are the horses I'm going to be looking to in the juvenile fillies. And I will uh, point out here as well that in these mile turf races at Keeneland, Christina, you, you spent a lot of time at Keeneland. Um, you know, those outside posts are tough. And so um, I did pull up a stat here, post 10 and outward, uh, a few years ago combined to go over for 47. Um, at the spring meet this year, I don't have updated fall numbers. I'm just pulling from an America's Best Racing article that was written before the fall meet. But, but for the spring, uh, post 10 and outward uh, were winless uh, with 48 starters. Now, with a horse like Delight, it's post nine, and it's also a horse with a bit of speed. So um, I don't think there's much concern there. I think Delight gets over, and, and I like where your head is at with that pick. Um, you can see here that we've moved to Saturday in the Breeders' Cup turf sprint. I've got a, a couple of horses I like here, one in particular. Before we do, though, uh, we, we, this is kind of a show where we're going to kind of abbreviate things and try to hit some of the highlights. Um, Scott, I just wanted to give you an opportunity as we look at just kind of wrapping up Friday and that discussion. Uh, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, uh, is there any way around Cave Rock? Or for you, is that is that a pretty solid uh, play on Friday? Um, you know, I mean, they're all... 
they're all vulnerable just because of the lack of experience. I mean, you've seen some weird things happen in that race, but I mean, I'm not knocking, I, I can't knock anything that Cape Rock's done. I mean, I'm not going to go out there and be like, oh, I'm going to try to beat this horse. If I see something in the workout reports right before, or if I see something, you know, or hear something that a trainer says, I mean, I'm always listening and kind of like looking for solid opinions. And if there's a way to beat Cape Rock, that'd be great because I mean, that morning line is probably accurate, if not lower. I mean, I could see the horse going lower. I mean, it's not a big field um, and it's a Baffert horse. I mean, with speed. So I have no reason other than from a betting perspective, I'm not excited to bet the horse at the price, but I'm not, I, I don't have any knocks. Christina, if any horse beats Cave Rock, who will it be? I don't know if anyone beats Cave Rock. I mean, Forte is the horse that has a nice number to get back to in his last race. He has a win over the track. I'm, you know, interested in what he can do. But I'll say this for a price, for a horse that I think can hit the board and that you might want to couple up with Cave Rock, Hurricane Jay at the rail, I think is interesting. He was so confidently handled in his last start by Joe Talamo. I don't think he's going to have any problem stretching out to the route of ground. He has a lot of size to him. He looks like a router and ammo racing. Um, he's one of the biggest owners in all of Europe. They have so many horses and he has a couple of really nice fillies in the turf sprint as well. I think all of his horses are well meant. He knows what it takes to win in America. He's just started to kind of dabble into the American racing. So I think Hurricane Jay can hit the board. I don't think they can beat Cape Rock though. All right, fair enough. For me, it would be lo Lost Ark if a, if, if a horse were to pull off the upset, but I'm with uh, the team here in saying that I think Cape Rock is a pretty solid play in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Um, on Saturday here, as you can see, the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint, uh, there's a little horse in here you may have heard of named Golden Pal, um, is going to be the heavy favorite in this race. Uh, so, of course, I'm going to look for a way to beat Golden Pal. And the horse that I think can do that is the one we've currently got highlighted. It's Casadero. Uh, you look on the left side there, you can see and highlighted in green uh, on the left side are, are the last two races. Those are the horse's first two turf races. And uh, the reason that's important is because prior to that, um, you kind of got mixed results from this horse. And then in the last two, yes, you see one loss and one win, but I want to dig into those a little bit because I think this is a horse who's truly coming into his own and they found something uh, with him, Brendan Walsh has specifically, after taking over as trainer two races back. And so that race at Saratoga, um, basically was was traveling wide in, in, into a pace where two horses up front kind of went on with it and could only get uh, within a couple of lengths. But I do want to take a look back at uh, the race at Woodbine, the New Arctic last race. I think visually there are some things there that are pretty interesting here. Um, th there's, as they load into the gate here, we kind of forwarded a little bit to the, about the 35 second mark. Um, as you watch this race unfold, again, pace being the important thing here, um, they go pretty slow up front. And right now, I think the video, at least on my end, looks very, very slow, much slower uh, than they actually went. But they go pretty slow up front for this level. And the two names that you see there, Silent Poet, Bound for Nowhere, those are going to be the same two horses in the stretch here who are up front. Now, look, no one else is, is finishing from behind except for that horse way, 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 way on the outside. Uh, that nine horse there is about to like blow past these horses like they're standing still. And these are good horses. Silent Poet, Bound for Nowhere. Bound for Nowhere is a superstar. Keeneland, too. Uh, Silent Poet, absolute star at Woodbine. So you can see no one gaining on those two horses, with the exception of Casadero, who blows by them entirely. Um, and if you look on the right side here, using race lens, those red uh, up arrows on the side there on the notes, that's an easy way to identify uh, when a horse has had some trip trouble. And so um, in both of those races, you can see off slow and then swung wide. Casadero lost a ton of ground, um, had to do a lot of work from way out of it and came up against pace that was not especially fast uh, for, for the levels of both of those races and still blew by. Uh, on the true odds page here, another feature on race lines. You can look at, uh, you could sort uh, on a number of different metrics, but one of them up top there is for late pace. So you see the two also eligibles, you can just completely uh, hit that 
that little eye on the left side and it, and it dulls them out of view. And so they're not in the equation at the moment. The horses that are are Campanel uh, with that 117 late pace figure. And who's second at Campanel? Tazadero, the second fastest late pace figure in the race. And the horse is going to be absolutely overlooked. This horse is 20 to one on the morning line. Why? Because Golden Pal is in the race. You can see the adjusted true odds using um, the algo uh, that uh, Equibase and Race Lens uses Golden Pal. Sorry, we're jumping all over the place here. But Equibase uh, has Golden Pal at eight to five. And I think that that's probably the right price there. We could um, sort those as well based on odds. So Golden Pal, the anticipated favorite in this race, eight to five. But um, for my money, I do see a good amount of speed in this race. And I think Golden Pal is going to have to work, is absolutely going to have to work. And I think it could set up, granted it's a short race, but it could set up for a horse like Casadero. Um, a few others that I have my eyes on, uh, we don't have to do that deep of a dive on them, are Emirati Anna. That's going to be the, uh, the three horse. I'm just going for bombs here. This horse hasn't won in a while, but has, again, that running style that could play perfectly here. Um, has to drop back early like he did in that Nunthorpe. Uh, visually, this horse is in form. And I think uh, with Ryan Moore getting aboard here, it, it's going to run a really good race. It should be able to save ground. And it's going to be another massive, massive price. Arrest Me Red will be um, uh, one that I use as well on my tickets. Arrest Me Red uh, should be, I think, at his best at this five and a half furlong distance. I think he'd be forgiven for his most recent uh, third place finish, even though that wasn't a terrible start. He dropped way too far back. That's absolutely not his style. He's usually more forwardly placed. I think he'll be up close. He'll have a lot of horses kind of gunning it from the lead, and he could probably tuck in second or third flight as I'm trying to envision um, how pace will unfold. Yeah, Wesley Ward, uh, again, the, the guy uh, you, you want to have in, in these races, right? Um this is one of the under you know, under the radar Wesley Ward horses this weekend. Arrest me red at 15 to one in the morning line. But yes, for me, Casadero is a top pick at 20 to one. I, I wouldn't be crazy enough to, to leave Golden Pal out of my exactas. Uh, but that's where I'm headed for the uh, Breeders' Cup turf sprint. Yeah, you see all that all, all that beautiful, that, that green, all those circles and ones on the right side there. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know what that means. This horse is going to be tough to beat. And, um, you know, obviously should be fast enough to assert himself early, but there are a bunch in here who I think at the very least make sure that um, Golden Pal doesn't get a breather. And I think um, we just might see an upset in this race. The next race on the card is race uh, five. It's the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, and it's Scott Coles' it's time to shine. Scott, what did you like here? Um, so I just find this race kind of fascinating. Um, so I have two horses that I like at big prices that I think are going to get overlooked. And what I'm like, my strategy in these types of days is, that you know, if you know, there's a bunch of good horses, or if you know, there's a couple, you can key. it's about finding the value in the trifecta. So what I, what I like to do is take both horses and put them in every spot of the trifecta and kind of like put out a ton of different trifecta bets. And like, as long as one of these long shots comes in, in any of the spot, I'll at least hit it. And if one of them happens to win, then I'll crush it. I mean, but at that, it's, you know, you can get, you can easily come up with air, but at least you're taking a shot with um, going for a large amount of money in a race like this, because I, I think it could fall apart. I think that some of the uh, best horses maybe aren't as good as they appear. And I think there's just some hidden value here. So um, if you go to the, PPs for law professional like we're on right now and you and you kind of take a look since the most recent layoff switch barns top two figures of the career maybe they figured something out um since the trainer change because yes one was on turf but you're kind of just seeing the ability the last one was a grade one again you see that green circle on the 115 in the last race that's the highest class rating in the field for the race no <laughs> I mean, no shame in running second to life is good. Um, obviously, life is good. It wasn't the best race we've ever seen from life is good, but you're still trying to keep up with a horse that has such high natural cruising speed that you're going to get discouraged. And this horse made a move at that horse on the turn and gave it a pretty good shot. Um, third off the layoff has every right to kind of improve it if this was the target and just kind of there's just going to be huge value there. And the figures aren't that far off. They're only a couple off the highest 
speed figure of anybody in this race. So I just think 20 to one morning line, if, if that starts to float up because of all the, the big names in this race and the, the, the many ways to go, I just think putting this horse in a bunch of different spots to hit the board or possibly win if things kind of fall apart and, you know, a law professor gets run on the, like Cody's wish and cyber knife, who I think, you know, have the best chance to win. But I mean, at the same time, I mean, if you get the jump on a horse like that and they get stuck in traffic, or if you get a trip up the rail, I mean, you see it all the time and you, you just, you're going to see a massive price on this horse who I think could be there in the end. And I think on numbers in both class and form and just improvement are, are not that far off um, for the morning line. And maybe, maybe because of that, the horse gets hammered. I, I'm just terrible at kind of predicting where the odds are going to fall. I mean, I could see the horse taking a ton of money and being a wise guy horse, but I could see the horse also getting ignored and being 25 to one. So we'll see on the day. We'll see if there's any scratches. We'll see. I mean, these are all the things you have to watch for, but between that horse being a lot of value. And then I don't have a great reason for simplification other than the fact that I feel like they dragged out the two turn experiment way too long. And I really think this horse all along has wanted one turn. Is the horse good enough? I mean, was good enough to compete at the shorter distances with the best three-year-olds. I don't know what that means, but I think getting back to that is going to be the best thing they could do for this horse. And we'll see. I think you could see the horse outrun its odds. Um, we'll see if it, it's just been too long of an experiment and the horse is just not, not with us anymore. But I'm just been waiting for this horse to get back to one turn. And I, I'm excited to see what you can do. Um, obviously. Cody's wish cyber and I would be very tough if they run their race or get their trips. Um, both horses are extremely talented, but um, looking for some value, hoping that one of them can take first or second, at least third, and just kind of spice up um, a few different trifectas, but I'll be, I'll be throwing a bunch of different ones out there and kind of calculating based on odds, um, a, a bunch of different bets, just keying them in all the spots. I love when Scott goes just massive long shot on us. Like, like sometimes it's like, well, yeah, I mean, there's no way to beat, you know, Cave Rock. There's no way to beat Flight Line. There's no way to beat Life is Good. And then sometimes he's like, you know what? This horse is going to win at like 100 to 1. So um, that's when I perk up. So thank you, Scott. I'm a, I'm a chalk player. I am, I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> Well, Chalk, by the way, has won this race the last two years. Dicks go, life is good. But did you know only four favorites have won this race uh, in the past 15 years? So, uh, yeah, so uh, not necessarily a race that's a chalky race, maybe a good time and a good spot without any real, I don't know. I mean, there's no real standout here, right? I mean, this is this is a race to, to take a shot. And, and I like um, I like where your head's at with Law Professor. Definitely one that I had overlooked. And so to your question of, well, you know, maybe this is one who will get a lot of you know, attention and becomes a buzz horse and gets bet down. I don't know. I haven't seen much buzz about him. So I, that's what I'm hoping for. And I just think, I mean, do you guys, do either of you think the cyber knife improves at one turn? Because if cyber knife improves at one turn, if it turns out that horse wanted to be at one turn, that, I mean, that horse could blow this field away. I mean, that I, cyber knife's super talented, but it, I just don't know if this, if this is a two turn race, I'd probably look at singling cyber knife, but the one turn cutback, I know it's to avoid the horses that have been recently beating you and just to not have to face flight line. I know why they're doing it. I just, and it's like tough to put your pride away and do this. So I respect them for going in the race where you could win, but I just, I don't know. Christina loved cyber knife from the beginning. So I kind of was going to defer to her. Do you think that he moves up at one turn? Well, so Keeneland, they don't run the mile very often, but we are going to here. And I, I love oh, Cyber Knife backing up in distance. Yeah. I, I think the backup in distance is really key for him. I mean, he has been able to carry his speed as much as he wants to going the mountain a quarter, going the mountain an eighth. But I think they can let him rip going going a flat mile, even though it is the two turn circumference. So I'm I'm interested in him. I do like Law Professor too, though. I also check the thoroughgraph figures and I talk about that a lot on FanDuel. And he's right there with some of the shorter price horses in this field. Yeah, that's what worries me. I just think once the figures get out there, that's going to know. So I'm glad you said that. I don't know why I fall asleep on the two turn mile there. Um, I don't bet Keelan very often, but the, I still think the short, yeah, the shorter distance helps simplification, but I, yeah, I still want to see him at one turn. So I'm not sure this is going to be the, the best. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. Cyberknife, because of the price you could get on Cyberknife, I'm still going back and forth of whether that could be a, a big bet or at least a big key with the others and like 
I think Florence is going to be really aggressive with him. I think when he feels like talking about Cyberknife, when he feels on, like he's on a horse that has enough speed to take a field, he has no problem being very decisive about that. So I think you're really going to see him hustle the horse out of the gate. The horse that kind of worries me in relation to that, though, is Laurel River. Laurel River is getting really good right now for Bob mm-hmm. Baffert. I've been watching him train a lot back at home. He's fresh. He's sharp. Bob hasn't been talking about him too much, but I don't know if he's trying to hold on to a little price too. He's nine to two on the morning line. I think Laurel River is going to be right there also. There's there's your buzz horse, Scott. I I've heard a lot of buzz about Laurel River. Yeah. Yeah. This horse is going to get bet down, I I, I think, based on, on some of the chatter that I've seen as well. And, um, you know, I'll say this to your scenario, Christina, with Cyberknife being sent. If you get sent, I mean, Pipeline is going. Um, that sets up perfectly uh, for a horse like um Laurel River. So um, if Cyberknife goes, you throw in a little bit of, you know, speed from, excuse me, slow down Andy. Um, you know, I, I, I think it could get pretty hot uh, if that develops. And then uh, Laurel River just sitting right off of them, I think. Uh, I mean, Gunite could go too, right? I mean, I could go as well. Yep, Gunite. Well, yeah. One of us have talked about Cody's wish. I mean, I don't really like the horse myself. He's the five to two morning line favorite, but I, I don't know if I'm so wrong about him. Yeah, it's just the price for me. It's just, I mean, we'll see where it moves. Um, I think the horse is talented and kind of closed into a slower pace in the forego. Um, when Jackie's Warrior probably wasn't, you know, wasn't Jackie Warrior's best race. But I mean, because of that, it's probably going to get bet down a little bit more than I would like to play for a race that's for a horse that's, I don't know. It's another horse that they could race more forwardly, but there are so many people that are going to want to do that. I'm not sure that's their in their best interest. I don't know. It's, there's a lot of different ways that people could ride their horse in this race. Is what made it so fascinating for me, which, so I was hoping for something weird to happen, but every time that happens more times than not, it ends up being chalk chalk and I just lose all my money. So <laughs> we'll see. Let's, let's have some optimism here. We got, we got yeah. 14, 14 swings at this thing. And hmm. um, I, I, I like this one. I, I like this as an opportunity to make a little bit of money. So if it means fading, you know, Cody's wish. Um, I, I think I could swallow that, uh, knowing that this feels like one of the more open races uh, on the two days, especially dirt races on the two days. So um, that was the, uh, I love saying this, the big ass fans, Breeders' Cup, Dirt Mile. Um, and we can move on now to one of the, I think one of the more anticipated races of the weekend. It's the uh, Longines uh, Breeders' Cup Distaff. And um, just a fun fact on this one, presented by America's Best Racing, of course, that's where I get all my fun facts for the Breeders' Cup. Uh, three-year-olds uh, have only won this race four times in the last 17 years, and they've been like standout three-year-olds. We sort of have one this year in Nest, uh, standout three-year-old, but uh, is it one of the older horses that uh, can can actually come through, or, or is it, you know, Nest this year kind of reasserting uh, some three-year-old dominance in this race? Um, what do you think, Christina? I'm stealing all your little fun facts, by the way. I'm going to come with this on the player's show. Thank you. I don't even have to go find it. I just keep writing down your your throws to the races. Um, So I started at the pace projection because I was interested in society and how she would look in here because I, in first glance, thought she could be low in speed. And that's pretty much what they're telling you that she is. I think this daughter of Gunrunner is very quickly improving right now, but I also think if you take a look through her form, she's been pretty carefully managed. I think Steve Asmussen has been brilliant about his placement of her. And there's only one occasion when she kind of took on the head of hitters of her division. And that was in the coaching club, American Oak. So I want to go to that race because my, I first went to that red trouble line for society in the coaching club. And I wanted to kind of find enough of an excuse for her in that race to go ahead and come back and play her in the distaff. So let's take a look at this race replay real quick. We'll pull this one up. So keep an eye on her as they come out of the starting gate. She is in, just double check. She's in post two, and it's actually the filly to her inside that takes the really significant bobble, but that kind of throws her off, as you saw. So she ends up taking kind of a second stutter step there and is behind this field for the majority of this first portion of the turn then she's pretty clearly one of those one-dimensional types that really wants the lead you can take a look 
She's really fighting the rider, Tyler Gaffleon, right now. He's actually going to let her kind of sneak up inside along the rail. And by the time they complete that first turn, she's back in the position where she wants to be. She's on the lead now. So given the fact that I know it was hard, I know she broke poorly, I know she had to kind of fight, rush up there. I would have wanted to see a better finish from her in this race. We can go ahead and forward it until when they come home, but Nest is going to blow her away. I mean, Nest goes off, you know, beats her by 17 and three quarters of a length in the end. So I was going back and forth between those two. And it really was the fact that I know she had trouble in that race. Just wasn't quite enough trouble for me to give her the excuse that, yeah, she could come back and she can beat these horses uh, coming into the race this weekend. We can jump to Nest. I think we kind of got the gist of that one anyways, but we'll jump over to Nest. A couple of points about some of the real heavy hitters in this race. They're all by Curlin. Nest is by Curlin. Uh, if you kind of peek back through your form there, Clarier is by Curlin. Malathot, Todd Fletcher's other horse, also by Curlin. Not only does Nest have the pedigree on the top side, and here she is as she's just going to kind of power away from this field. There were some really impressive races at Saratoga this summer, but I thought none more so than her. Not only this race that you're looking at in the coaching club, but then the Alabama as well. And, you know, Secret Oath beat her in the Kentucky Oaks, but I think Nest really just keeps getting better and better as the years go has gone on and as the distances have progressed. I mean, there were even a lot of people talking about, should she take on the boys? Should she run in the class? <laughs> Let's take a look at her. That's Marion Ravenwood. Uh, just look at the, the offspring she's produced. I know you like Lost Ark and the Juvenile and Future Stars Friday. He's the half-sibling to Nest. Other horses in here, Dr. Jack, as you can see. Uh, if you scroll down, you'll see Idol is in this uh, group as well. He's a mile and a quarter winner, Pacific Classic winner from years back. This is a real blue hen mare. She's produced 39% winners lifetime at the dirt route, and they're all in very top class company. Then I went to the trainer. And you could apply these, you know, statistics to Malathot as well, but I kind of wanted to use the pedigree research on Nest to make it a little bit more tailored to her. I have no, all the confidence in the world, obviously, in trainer Todd Fletcher, uh, taking a look at him in grade one stakes with a winner last out. So they're coming in in good form, both of these horses, coming back in a grade one event. He's at 22%. No problem there. Nest should definitely come back with a big race. So I, I went back and forth quite a bit. I wondered about the pace. Ultimately, I think Nest really is the class and she just keeps getting better right now, Dan. Scott, how about you? How did you see, uh, I mean, it's, it's a fun race. I mean, the pace is, is I think, is the big question. Uh, how did you see all that unfolding and, and who do you like? Um, so there's a few I'm going to use, but um, I think to start, yeah, just with the true odds page and all the things you can do with it, I disagree with the early race projection where they have search results placed um search results gets in a race like this without a lot of speed i mean the horse was going after latruska this like i just don't see the horse sitting back in a race now might be a little bit more willing to let society go than um they were with latruska because i don't think they'll be as worried about a society because latruska just you know last year if every it was in everybody's head if you let Latruska go Latruska was going to win like you couldn't so I think they took it upon themselves to absolutely go after and ran some pretty good race I mean that that race this summer at Belmont was a monster effort just couldn't kind of sustain the run after just you know going after it was that hard and I also just don't my issue with search results is I don't think a mile and eighth and longer is what search results is going to be best at and I, so I just don't see that being here, but if, I mean, if search results comfortably clears, I could see a scenario where, you know, she gets brave and tough to run down at the end. Um, but I think she'll keep society honest. I think she'll be closer than this says that being said, the person who sits right behind them in my eyes and, and has the, the, you know, the natural ability to stay close enough and then make the move and needs to his nest. And nest is improving. Nest has ran insanely impressively this year. Um, unless she does something weird where she moves earlier, gets too keen, or just kind of is forced into something, I think she's by far your most likely winner. But there is a scenario I can see where some of the figures are a little higher than they should be on Nest because Nest, if we discover that Secret Oath, <laughs> luckily the day I picked Secret Oath, Secret Oath won because that was lucky, lucky looking at what Nest has done to her since. 
is that if that's the best horse she's faced her and Mo Donegal this year, I mean, we find out that eh, the competition that Ness was facing wasn't that great. You have, and you have two like Malathot and Claire Air running at her late. I mean, that could be a throwdown. I mean, those two horses are very classy and very good. Um, I'm not sure that they'll get quite as much pace as they have been lately, but you never know. Um, I don't want to leave them out. I will be waiting nest heavier. Um, and I also think the matchup between who you pick out of Malathot and Claire Air is interesting because outside of last race, I mean, Claire Air was favored in that personal insane had all sorts of trouble, was fractious, hit the gate, did everything, but was the favorite in that very, very classy race. I mean, you throw that race out, if you say that those excuses are valid, where being fractious, hitting the gate, and just just ran a dud because of all the things that went on pre-race and at the gate are valid, then Clarier being the third, possibly the third betting choice in this race is massive value. Um, just things to kind of think about. I'm still thinking about it. As of right now, I'm keying Nest as probably my A and using Malafat and Clarier as like kind of like my B horses is how I'm looking at it right now with maybe some others, depending on what I see in here. Um, and I want to play search results so bad, but I just, at this distance, I'm just having trouble with anything more than kind of like a saver ticket. So that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. You, you've got it. This field is feels so deep that you've got to really just find reasons to not like certain horses. And, um, for me, with Nest, I mean, the only knock I, I can come up with on Nest is, is honestly that she's at the end of a, of a long campaign for a three-year-old, definitely has the most impressive resume of any this year, but she's facing fresher horses, and, and some of them, I think, are hitting peak form, and, and they haven't um, had as long a campaign, and the one that jumps out to me, of course, is Society, who's going to be my top pick. Um, you see the highlight there in green. You could sort by run style. You see the E up top there. Uh, meaning that that is the only early pace horse uh, in the race. You got the green highlight, which again, reinforced here, lone speed leader, um, and the only one with early speed tendencies. Uh, to Scott's point, I, I don't think that search results is going to be all that far back. I think search results will be up close. I think awake at midnight will be up close. So you've got two horses I think will be putting on some token pressure. But if you go back and you look at the PPs and, and you look at um, what society did in the cotillion and you watch that replay i mean that is just a devastating effort i mean just just a crazy performance and, and florent Giroux rode the horse as if there was absolutely zero chance he was ever coming back to that field he, he could have gone 21 flat and, and 43 flat and he felt like he was still going to win at a mile on the 16th without any issue and, and that's essentially what happened and and i think that's what they're going to do here they're going to go as fast as they can possibly go they're going to clear the field um, they're going to try to, you know, open up a couple of lanes. Like I said, you're going to have a few horses chasing. And then I think it sets up for a horse from off the pace. Uh, Scott mentioned the horse I like to finish second. I love Claire Air to finish second in this race. She just ran such an uncharacteristically bad race in the personal ends. And you got to toss it and figure that she closes into a super hot pace. But as we look at society here, um, you look at the progression on uh, the Equibase speed figures going from a 105 to a 111. That's exactly what you want to see, the numbers just going up and up and up, and hopefully there's a bigger number there. Uh, the tops in this field, by the way, for an Equibase speed figure is 113. That's Malathat. So you have this horse who hasn't raced much, only has a few races, and already has a 111. Um, you could tell that it's her best number because it's highlighted in green. The second best number would be highlighted in yellow for each horse as you're looking at um, these race lines uh, PPs. And, you know, she's won every race but one. And, and that one that she didn't win, we saw earlier, where you saw the trouble indicator stumbling out of the gate. We, we took a look back at that race. It took away her, her, her main weapon, as Christina pointed out, was her speed. Once she didn't get to the front, um, she, was, she was pretty much done for. And um, barring something like that happening, uh, I think uh, society truly runs away with this. One more point of emphasis here in terms of what you could do with race lines and all the various searches that you can customize. This one in particular uh, was a search we did for uh, for pedigree. And you've heard the buzz and, and you know that Gunrunner uh, is just, you know, producing all these just really like beastly horses right now who are, who are just dominating, uh, especially uh, at, at these kinds of distances. So we search specifically for um, nine to 10 furlongs, um, grade one races uh, with 14 starts. Uh, you see here that Gunrunner has produced five winners 
eight in the money finishers, a 36% win percentage. Uh, it is a smaller sample than some of the others in this race. Uh, but, you know, you see some of those horses that Gunrunners produce, Cyberknife, Early Voting, Taba, uh, and this one, Society, I think, is going to be right up there in the discussion with some of the best to be produced thus far by Gunrunner. Um, and then you could also show all is, is another tool here where you can compare how do these numbers stack up against some of the other sires in this race. Um, you can see some good numbers there, the ones that you expect, obviously, the Curlins, all the Curlins, um, you know, are, are generally, you don't have to have any concerns with them at this distance. Um, but Gunrunner in particular right now is on pace to become uh, sort of the leading sire for this, uh, for this particular distance. You're looking at a mile and an eighth and up. And I think uh, I have no distance questions. I have no doubt who the fastest horse in the race is. And I think I'm going to get the best price out of any of these horses that we've talked about on society. So for me, uh, I may regret this later on. Best bet of the weekend for me, society. I see Christina's face. <laughs> She's like, what do you want? Oh, I like it. I like that you're coming strong. Like I, Because I, as I said, I wanted to pick her. I'm looking at her. I'm looking at the pace was wondering about it. I actually called Rich Perloff because he picked her in the cotillion. He was there on site for us that day. And I said, just have, are you coming back with her? Like, what's your plan? He said, yeah. He said, she just really blew me away in that race. And for all the reasons that you mentioned, she's young, she's fresh, she's kind of up and coming. He's all in too. So she'll be on my tickets, but I, I just went back and forth and then I settled on nest, but you're, you're slowly convincing me to go back to my gut, which was my first pick with society we'll see come friday look i, I think uh you can go into that race if you're playing pick threes or or a double or whatever feeling pretty good uh if you have a couple of the horses that we've mentioned i think we all um respect nest um we know what nest has done this year uh there are a few others here i think scott and i both like um uh clarier a little bit um and then you got malathot you, you look it, this is a um a really fun race but you do have to, at some point, kind of come with a strong opinion. And uh, if you're playing the multis, uh, th this is potentially a spot where you could do it because you can't bet all of them. So um, for me, as I said, society and, uh, you know, we'll see uh, we'll see how this race unfolds. Let's move on to um, the turf. Uh, the turf, uh, always a fun race. This is one. Um, where Europeans have done really, really well since 2007. Only three American-based horses have won this race. Three since 2007 have won that are based in America. So look for a Euro here. Um, the one you see highlighted there, Nation's Pride, trained by Charlie Appleby. He also has Rebels Romance, and he also won this race last year with Yabir. Um, Christina, how do you see this one? Oh, so I'm going to go to... Mishrif in here. Sorry. <laughs> Do you want to let Scott go first? I'm easy either way. I I landed on Mishrif, uh, the 11 in here. And there's not a whole lot that I can kind of show you just in terms of, you know, research and whatnot, because we're dealing with a European trainer and, and all of those kind of statistics that we'd have to pull from somewhere else. But uh, in his past performances, you look at that August the 17th race at York, that Judmont International, just take a look at that running line. He's second to Baid. I mean, Baid, I know he lost in the swan song of his career, but widely considered one of the best turf horses uh, that we've seen in a long time since Frankel. There were a lot of comparisons to him. So the second place effort to Baid goes a long way in my mind for him. And then in his last two starts, uh, the Irish champion stakes, which is that race at Leopardstown and then the arc at Longchamp. I mean, those conditions were so soft, soft turf courses, but John Gosson said it was like a swamp out there practically in Paris. There was no getting over the top of that ground. And Mishrup is a horse that for a Euro, he carries a lot of condition. I actually saw him this morning and yesterday morning. He looks so good, but those bigger, stronger, kind of heavier type horses, they have a really hard time getting that big frame over a softer course. We've had a lovely fall here in Kentucky. We had a tiny bit of rain earlier this week. The sun hasn't really come out just yet in the last couple of days, but it's going to be warm. We're going to have good weather. This will be the firmest course that he's been on in a long time, which I think goes a long way for Mishrif. And I also noticed that John Gosson's putting the blinkers on. I mean, I think that's just interesting. Sometimes when you get an older horse, remember John Gosson, when he was a young uh, trainer, was in Southern California. He trained in the U.S. for a long time. 
And I think he kind of calls on some of the experience that he has there, knowing that you just need to be a little bit sharper in the U.S. You need to be more focused in the gate. You need to jump better. You need to put yourself into the race. And I think that's what he's hoping for from Mishriff. Uh, he's six to one morning line, Frankie Dettori aboard. He'll be my top pick. I found a little bit of a price though with Masterpiece, the eight in here for Michael McCarthy. Masterpiece has a win at Keeneland. It was a long time ago. It was against uh, Allowance Company. It was back in April of 2021. It's kind of towards the bottom of his form there. But I was interested in his sire in Master Craftsman, just pulling a little research to kind of try and support my opinion that he's improving right now and that that Keeneland race will help him out a little bit. Individual research for this sire on the turf at the route in graded stakes races. It's a pretty high percentage, 24%. He's eight for 33, 61% in the money. And I would really argue that as nice of a horse as he is, he's not getting the mares that the Dubawis are. He's not getting the mares that the Lope de Vegas are. I mean, he's really moving them up. So I'm going to give Masterpiece a chance to probably not win the race, but to round out some of those exactus trifecta supers that Scott was talking about can really make you a lot of money. Mishriff, the top pick. All right, Scott. Now, you know, I set you up all up for to talk about Charlie Appleby and then I tossed to Christina. Totally. <laughs> totally oh, it's, it's fine. Um, yeah. So for me, I think nation's pride um if you go to the if you just <laughs> to keep it simple if you go to the research tab um i mean appleby has the two horses in here and if you look at what he's done okay over here 54 <laughs> percent wins that's insane um obviously not as many sample like a huge sample size but then if you look at the jockey um <laughs> and you see what he's done um when you sort by win percentage that's one of the most insane numbers I've ever seen seven for nine with eight in the money. I mean, so that tells me, I don't know how many scenarios there have been. I'd have to do more research of when he had two horses to pick from, or if he was just being sent because that's who they spotted. But it seems like whenever he's had a decision to make Buick has picked pretty well. I mean, it's hard to pick much better than that. Um, so I trust his judgment on picking nation's pride um, over the five and I just think um, they have been on fire. It's hard to go against. Had is had races in this country, kind of, you know, had that had that weird race where the the field got wired a little unsuspectingly, and then since then, I mean, it just rattled off some huge finishes. Um, has great closing kick, still improving. Um, and I just think if you go to the True Odds page, which we're at in right now, and you kind of analyze that, I mean, the horse has pretty decent cruising speed. I mean, you're, they're projecting the horse to be very close early. I don't know if I hoping for the, that close, but I mean, at the same time, the Euros have come over here and kind of exploited that a little bit. I mean, some of these jockeys have taken advantage of some front running trips on the turf over here going longer and just kind of still have the ability to finish. And it's really, it's really been an, a preferred tactic. And I think if you sort by late pace um, over on the left there, I mean, if you're going to be that close up and you're still going to have a, a late pace figure, that's, that's plenty good enough. Um, I think it might even be a little bit higher with some of the finish. And I think the improvement, I think there's still more late kick there that we haven't seen. Um, and you combine that with all these things um, that they have going with the connections. I just, that's the one I'm most excited about. And I think um, as Dan will probably touch on more as well, that Buick kind of picked for us there and we're <laughs> hoping he's right. Um then the other one, as Christina mentioned, her topic, I will not be leaving off Miss Ruth either um, because of the impressive resume, because of the, just the, the ability. Um, it's a little bit trickier. Um, I'm not as great with the European form, but obviously I know Baid, um, and I know um, just some of the, some of the horses, at least this horse has been running against since the ability. And I think the firm turf is a great point. I mean, all these things are the reasons why the Euros come over here. And with their dominance in this race, that's one I would not ignore, especially if that price is anywhere close to six to one, that is huge value on a horse like that. So that that's a great bet that day if that holds. I'm not sure that it will, but I think Miss Riff will be a buzz horse as well. But no one, everyone in, is going to see the Applebee stats. So I think you still will get some of it. You'll at least get something on Miss Riff. I don't think it'll be six to one, but you'll get something um, better than you probably should if it weren't for those stats. So. Um, that's kind of where my focus is. Love 
you know, I have a lot of respect for what I got us. I just think um, these horses are just a little bit better. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting. You both, you both like Mishriff. I, I, I kind of, I was not on team Mishriff, but if you, if you both like the horse and maybe I ought to take another look here. Um, look, the, the horse has the, the credentials, has the resume. Um, I just thought maybe it was getting a little long in the tooth or at least is, you know, not, not in peak form right now, but there are reasons for that, including, um, you know, the surface and, and level of competition as well. And so, uh, maybe this is the, the day and the opportunity for Mishriff to, uh, uh, to be Mishraf. Um the horse that I that I do like here at, at an absolutely massive price is the horse to his inside. That's Red Knight. Um, this is a horse who had uh, significant excuses. Uh, I thought uh, in his most recent. You see um, that he uh, he stayed. We actually want to take a look at this race. Yeah, we could watch this race uh, briefly. Let's let's pull up the um, uh, replay of the Sycamore here. Um, pick it up uh, probably around the one fifteen one twenty mark. We don't have to watch the whole race. Um, and and you'll see uh, in looking at this replay that uh, Red Knight uh, is on the outside. Um, he steadies pretty badly here. Um, okay, here we go. It was a little tough here when uh, we play these back, and obviously uh, the, the the buffering <laughs> it, it takes a moment. But you could always go back and watch these replays again. There's a you can have a subscription for a dollar right now. Stats Raceland. You go and you have access to all these replays. But anyhow, Red Knight, take my word for it, a steady pretty badly here uh, on the backstretch. And then as they um, turn for home, okay, now we got it. Now we're, we're back at, well, maybe not. But um, they, when they turn for home, um, Red Knight does make this uh, pretty big late move. And, and when you're looking at this race, you're like, wait, this horse finished eighth. Like, why, how, am I, how did this horse finish eighth and run a big race? And it's because not only did he steady, as, as I alluded to earlier, and still kind of regrouped and picked himself back up, he also travels widest of all off this turn and is able to close the gap here to, uh, to about a length and a half of, uh, of the winner. And he's the horse, um, he's the two horse here. So you'll see him on the far outside. Uh, like I said, you may have better luck just um, pulling this up uh, on your own. He's running on the wrong lead for, for a while there. He, he's just a, he's just a hot mess in this race and still just on raw ability uh, manages to sweep by a bunch of these horses and then the ones that he didn't get by um, make it look like he ran a terrible race but he only finished uh, two lanes beaten so I like that I, I knew he'd be overlooked and I know that he's going to be overlooked so I like that as well um, that 116 equibase speed figure uh, career best there so um, you know that he's in form. So that's another uh, another check mark for the horse. And you look at his past performances at this distance in particular has started 11 times, four wins, three runner up finishes. Uh, it's all there in that handy little uh, cheat box on the top right there. You can see how he's done here. So he, he, this is a distance that, that he likes. And um, you know we don't talk too much about pace in mile and a half races, but um, you know the pace here could be, um, uh, you know, somewhat, I mean, really, bye-bye Melvin on the rail, is, it's going to be on the lead. I don't think it'd be wise for them to just let him go. And, and I think there are a couple of horses just to his outside who might put a little pressure on. And so if the pace is honest, if Red Knight gets a clean trip, I think he runs a big race here. And uh, Luis Saez, you see there, is the jockey. Pretty big uh, upgrade. Uh, no disrespect to Gerardo Corrales, um, Luis Saez uh, hopping aboard for the first time uh, is another positive here. So big fan of Red Knight. He's going to make this big move late. Uh, does he get up to win? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, does he hit the board at 35, 40 to one? I think there's a good chance he might. So um, I like Red Knight a little bit. That, that's the one uh, I'm going to go with as sort of my long shot surprise play here. And just going back to Nation's Pride for a moment, uh, Scott mentioned it's pretty big that Buick lands on Nation's Pride as opposed to Rebels Romance. If you click on uh, trainer Charlie Appleby, uh, this is just another version of the search that uh, Scott did earlier. This one in particular uh, was just basically just pairing them up with Buick. You saw their numbers individually and how well they did, um, have they, they've done individually. This is them together, uh, 14 starts uh, in North America, 
nine wins, 11 in the money, just, just absolutely bonkers, right? I mean, just, just numbers that don't make any sense. You don't see this, this sort of success rate uh, at any level in racing. And so um, pretty astounding that him and William Buick have teamed up to, uh, to do this. And then and no, uh, just to add to your point before we go away from this, something else the viewers can see, if you look at the official finish and you look at the odds, it's the two horses that didn't, you, that it didn't take any money that lost that were at least on the screen. So mm -hmm. it's like when now you couple it, this horse is going to take money and your mm -hmm. odds go even higher. You could toss out that 18 to one shot. Cause obviously if a Buick, if the connections of these horses aren't taking money, that horse didn't have a chance like it. Right. No. So it's even higher than that as far as like true odds go. So it's, it's nuts. It's actually mm -hmm. nuts. Let's filter this by date as well. Uh, let's look for, for date. And this is funny. So you see that um, the second one on the list is uh, Wojeda. This is before we knew that they were going to dominate like this. So Wojeda goes off at 11 to 1 uh, and wins the Breeders' Cup there. Uh, and so, yeah, it's just been, uh, with the exception of uh, the, those couple of early uh distance distant defeats um it's just win after win after win worst case scenario they finish third in a race so uh, nation's pride you just can't leave off your tickets if you're playing a trifecta i mean yeah. you, you're asking for the ticket to, to to be ripped up if you don't uh throw nation's pride on your ticket um we can also hit show all here this is a feature we showed earlier you can compare appleby and buick to some of the other trainee trainer jockey combinations in this race uh, we said it's it's incomparable. You don't really see anything like that. But you do have uh, Phil D'Amato and Flavian Pratt uh, at 35%, probably the closest you'll see uh, anywhere of a trainer jockey combination on the turf in graded stakes races. Uh, they've got Gold Phoenix, D'Amato, Pratt, uh, who I like a little bit as well. Lots of solid races all year long in California. Uh, best was uh, two back, I think, in the Del Mar handicap. Actually, beat Masterpiece, who we talked about a few moments ago with a late rally. Uh, so, Gold Phoenix is is one that's that's interesting. And uh, if you like, you know, the whole which which combos uh, generally succeed. Here's one as well, Phil D'Amato, Flavian Pratt. Uh, doesn't get as much buzz anymore. Um, one that we've known for years, been successful out west. But um, uh, here's another one to keep an eye on: Gold Phoenix. All right, let's get to the feature. We've got a little bit of time left. We're going to talk about the classic. And um, I think this is a wide open race, guys, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who's, who's picking against Flight Lane? Anybody? Brave <laughs> enough. Who's going to do it? I'm going to start uh, with our true odds page just to sort of hammer the point home about. Flight line. Let's sort for the early, the run style first, just to take a look there. Life is good, as we know, is very fast. Flight line is very quick as well, but life is good. Could be on the lead if he wants to. I think the post position draw really worked out in the favor of flight line, being able to be drawn just outside of life is good. And Todd Fletcher has really said that they're committed to sending life is good. So contrary to what you see on the right hand side, I do think life is good is going to be on the front end because I think that's kind of his only way of hoping to defeat flight line. Let's sort it for late pace as well, just to see no surprises here, but flight line, definitely the fastest uh, in late pace, pretty good margin over the rest of the field. I was surprised to see Olympiad kind of trend so high at that point, because Olympiad is a horse that also to the point that I made about society, I think has been kind of carefully managed here or there he has a lot of wins but he hasn't always taken on these types of horses uh, getting back to life is good because i think a lot of people do give him a a, a chance in here and, and just think that he's maybe he's going to be second you know we'll see how far he's going to carry that speed i don't think he really is a mile and a quarter horse uh, i think we kind of saw that in his form in the dubai world cup he ended up fourth that day todd fletcher saying that the track was really deep and kind of cuppy. That does tend to happen in Dubai. So maybe that was the excuse. But also, if you look closer at his pedigree, here's his damn beach walk. She didn't do a whole lot. In fact, she never won a race and she was a sprinter. She only tried two turns once. Wayne Catalano had her. So that kind of tells you what he thought about her in general, that she was more of a one-turn horse. Into Mischief is a world-class sire. He has sired a Kentucky Derby winner. We know an authentic a couple of years ago. Uh, but I think overall, as you kind of take a look at the research with him, horses on the main track going greater, going 10 furlongs and beyond, 
it's it's not as high as kind of his overall win percentage with all horses. You're looking at 12%. It's a smaller sampling, three winners from 25 starts. Authentic accounts for a couple of those, as you see at the top there. So for me, as good of a horse as life is good is, and in any other year, we'd be talking about him as, you know, a great horse coming into this classic. I just don't think he wants the distance, let alone wants, you know, a piece of flight line in here. Uh, Taba along the inside is a horse that has a lot of ability. He's a young horse. He's a son of gun runner. I've just been really interested by the work pattern. If you kind of look down at those works, Bob Baffert has worked him every five days, pretty much. He is really turning the screws on this horse. He is a lazy horse in the morning. His works are never really going to blow you away, but I think Bob has him so fit and he's probably going to run a peak performance. So maybe Taba for a piece of it. If something crazy happens up front, I do think Taba will be rolling late and he has that big kind of late kick. And then Epicenter, a quick look at him. I've kind of been intrigued by how Todd or how Steve Asmussen has really freshened a lot of his horses into the Breeders' Cup this year. Many of them didn't have a final prep. He's kind of trained a lot of them up of the last race at Saratoga and given them about eight weeks or so and all of those works. And he's also a trainer that brings them to the host location early. He did this in Del Mar, brought them early. He's done it here. They've all been here for about a month. Epicenter is a son of not this time. A lot of distance there. He's out of a candy ride mare. A lot of distance there. And he's already kind of proven himself <laughs> going the classic distance anyway. And then lastly, just Steve Asmussen with regard to that time away. The grade one races, 61 to 180 days is where I filtered it. He's at 25%. So here's another nice horse that might be able to run a big race. Looks like he's probably going to run a career best, a top number. But I don't know if any of them are really in fight lines league in here. I think what we kind of forget, or at least I forgot until I was reminded and looking again at his form. The Pacific Classic was his first race around two turns. I mean, how do you do that in your first attempt at two turns, going a mile and a quarter to win by 20 lengths? It's It blows me away every time I look at that replay. He's that good. I'd agree, Scott. Yeah, I mean, I even wrote in the outline, though, there's nothing clever, but it's just the best horse I've ever seen. And I've said it, I said it before the Pacific Classic, and I continue to feel that way, like that I'm as big of an American Pharaoh fan as there ever was. But this, this horse is something different. I, I've never, like, I think, I, I hope when they say that, they, that the horse might race next year, that's true. I doubt it. If the horse blows away in the classic, I'm not sure with how carefully I've handled it. But I hope just because it's like, you rarely get to see something this special and it's just incredible to watch. Um, if you just look at the PPs that we're on right now, I mean, he is the best figure of anyone in the field, which you see. Um, I mean, if you hover over that 128, it, it lights up a lot of things because there's a there's a few circles there. It's like harder to see, but they're just it, it's the best figure. It's the best figure at the distance. The best this that figure could have been so much better. You could argue that the numbers should just have been made higher, but people were. I think a lot of the figure makers were scratching their head. They're like, "Can we give a figure this high?" And I've heard a lot of discussions on that. Like, that there's arguments that they could be higher. Timeform US gave a much higher figure than everyone else. Now. So, but the buyer and that base figure, I mean, came back, whatever, not as high as it probably could have been. Now, keep in mind that that's the first try at, at two turns, like we talked about. The horse went sub 110 to the six furlongs, which I know is what Alice's biggest concern was, was like the 109, six furlong, 108, whatever, if they can't control them, like, doesn't matter. It didn't matter. The horse was geared down. Like it was a jog. I mean, it was just a jog at the end, like for so much of the stretch that, I mean, if that horse would have gone all out, like what would we have seen? And I know that it, it's much different when you're running by yourself, but is, is, isn't this horse always going to be running by himself? Like, like, I don't know, like who can do that? No one can do that. So I just, it's hard to knock anything. And like, this isn't like, if this was the Kentucky Derby, or like a 20 horse field or something, there's like ways to get in trouble. Like, but the horse has already overcome a terrible break and still, you know, won easily um, at Belmont. I, I just, I'm trying to think what could possibly go wrong other than the horse just not being right that day that we don't see just another absolutely massive performance and that you 
to get value, you better either string a cold double or just nail an exactor or try with like being very skinny, or you're going to be betting against the pool, like in the takeout because the horse is going to be so short. Um, so you single and multis, but you know, be careful about how much money you're putting in to that is my only advice because I don't even know if you're going to get three to five. I mean, do you guys think you're going to get three to five? I'm not so sure. I think people are going to want to say, I had this ticket that day and just those like, you know, those memento like type days where everyone is just like getting at least some ticket on flight line to say that they were, they had a ticket that day that said flight line's name. I mean, I just think the horse is going to take more money. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I just think two to five, one to five is more likely. Um, so you just got to be careful how you bet it, but I, in no way am I going to back up against this horse because, and, and I like a lot of horses in here. I almost wish they were running to this without him and with him just so that we could see what it would be like. Cause it'd be a fascinating race without him, but it, with him, it is just insane. And I just, um, I, I don't want to, you know, talk about the things we've already talked about. So, I mean, just having that pace advantage has the speed to go in front early and has the best late pace in the field. And I still think has more like a better race in him if he needed to, like, it's insane. I just, I, I can't wait to watch. Scott's Scott's all struck. You know, he doesn't he doesn't even know what to say. Uh, it's incredible. <laughs> or have him run. How about this? Instead of running two races, how about we just we have him run for purse money only, right? All right I don't. <laughs> Wait, we'll, we'll set that aside. Yeah. Uh, so sore subject I'm, with last year. I lost a lot of money because somebody had to run for purse money only. Oh, I know. That's, that's what I said. I didn't want to open it up. I just I just want yeah. to little zinger and move off. You know, that's. <laughs> I'm not over it. I won't be over it. Modern games, oh, modern are games. You bet him again this year. Are you coming back to bet modern games again? I think I have to, but at the same time, right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ugh, Make up so for it. Get it all so back. Fr <laughs> so frustrating. <laughs> Torture you, Scott. Um, I do. I do agree with you. Uh, flight line and and Christine as well. Both of you. The flight line is going to be extremely tough to beat. In terms of what I think he'll go off at, I think two to five feels right. I mean, I would say one to five and. In, in most fields and in most years, but this is a pretty talented field and it, you know, you can make enough of a case for life is good and um, epicenter and, and Taba. I, 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 so you could make a case. I'm not saying that's going to be a good case or a winning case, but I think there are enough people out there trying to make a case that one of those horses sure. can you know, sure. win the race that, that two to five feels about right. Um, with life is good. I, I just kind of want to, double down on, on some of what Christina said in terms of the fears about this distance with this horse. Um, and just, if we could just replay, just show a replay the very, very end last quarter mile or so of the Whitney, uh, which he won. Um, he wins this race, but sometimes you oh, you won it like a good thing. Th this is not winning it like a good thing. This is, this is winning it like a, like a very tired thing. And, um, you know, I, and I feel for happy saver here because happy saver ran down on the inside. Happy saver is the five horse. Um, and life is good as the center there, the six horse happy saver run, run the race of his life here. And then life is good. Just kind of just, just, just comes over, just, just lugs all the way in and happy saver has to has to come back out has to you know get the uh you know the legs working right again and once once he's he straightens out he, he's still running and he you know he's beaten a couple of lengths there um but you could see the way life is good finished up there and he's done it before uh where you see him late late in the late in the game getting tired um obviously the dubai up uh was another race in which um granted he went really fast and took pressure in that race that was not his day but just another race where you kind of see him getting tired late I, I don't see how a mile and a quarter um is going to do this horse any favors um we can look at the into mischief uh, pedigree search it's sort of similar to to what christina pulled up earlier uh just again confirmation that um you know uh, the only horse that has been able to really do this at this distance integrated stakes race on the dirt uh, was authentic. And, and aside from authentic, um, there's no uh, real track record for into mischief horses going this distance, uh, mile and eighth being, I think, the absolute ceiling, but mile and a quarter for into mischiefs uh, is, is asking a lot. And plus you have the, the, the additional uh, pedigree research that Christina pulled up on the dam side as well. So uh, a lot to be afraid of with life is good. And also I don't see a scenario which he's absolutely loose on the lead, whether it's it's Taba or, um, you know, uh, any, any number of horses who have the ability to flash uh, just, just to the outside, um, including 
Um, I don't, I, I mean, I would say maybe, maybe Epicenter is going to stay up close. Olympiad's got the ability to stay close. Um, and, uh, and Taba again is, is one who's not, who's not slow. So I think they should be going, uh, in honest enough pace. Now, here's the deal. If they all go wild and they're all like, look, we can't let flight line get away. Like you did in the Pacific classic, then you have a bunch of horses, uh, chasing after flight line, except for one. I mean, the only horse I know that for sure will not chase, well, maybe two, uh, m maybe, um, uh, you know, we'll see with Happy Saber, he doesn't chase, but Rich Strike, I know for sure, will not be chasing, and if we sort by run style, which we have here, you see the early pace is life is good, all those P there are the pressers, the horses that'll be, um, you know, trying to stay within, um, you know, I, you know, with, within a range of life is good, and then you have Rich Strike with the S, who's going to be, uh, it's a sustained run, but you can see he's going to, might be off your screen for a good portion of the race, so if they are all chasing, life is good. Um, and I think this this comes back to the conversation of how you bet this race. I've never been a big Rich Strike fan, but I've got to respect what he's done. He actually hasn't run nearly as bad as 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 I think maybe people just joking about him might think. Was just second in the Lucas Classic, ran a ran a decent race in the Travers, finishing finishing fourth. Life is good. Uh, excuse me, Rich Strike is a horse who um, at twenty to one on the morning line. I think is going to be every bit of that. And I don't know that that Derby buzz is still there to get people to just say, Oh, I want to bet on the Derby winner. I think rich strike is rich strike. And then he's going to go off probably about 30 to one. And maybe that's an exact, uh, that makes sense. Maybe flight line over rich strike is one uh, worth investing in. Uh, I, I think if you're looking at the, the other exact uh, will pays right before the race, you're going to see some really skinny numbers flight line to life is good or to Taba and all the rest of them. For me, Rich Strike is the only viable exact to play in this race, um, unless for maybe Happy Saver, who also will be coming off of it. The only reason I'm a little uh, kind of uh, being cautious what I say about Happy Savers, because as of the time of this recording, um, there was a report that came out earlier today that um, Happy Saver didn't train uh, this today, and basically he's got a quarter crack. His left hind foot, apparently he's still targeting the race. Uh, but uh, he ha he did not train today, so he missed a day of training, and he's got a quarter crack. So I, I don't know. I to me that that's generally not a good <laughs> a good sign. And so um, I, I'm going to kind of set Happy Saver to the side for now and kind of leave him out of the discussion in terms of viable contenders. Is there anyone else we should discuss? Uh, Olympiad maybe is one who's getting a bit of short shrift here. Um, Christina, do you have any thoughts or feelings on Olympiad? Yeah, I, I think Olympiad's a very good horse. I think he's looked really good in the mornings. We've seen him on the breakfast show uh, the last few days. But I, I think if you look through his performances or his past performances, just look through his running lines. I mean, Olympiad beat him last time out. And then he beat American Revolution, Proxy, Silver Prospector, Cowboy Diplomacy. These aren't the life is goods and the flight lines of this division. When he did face these horses, he was fourth. So he needs to improve. He needs to come with his career best. He does make his own trip. He's a versatile horse. So you have to like that about him as far as the pace goes. He's one for one at Keeneland. He definitely has some positives in his corner, but it would take something we haven't seen from him yet to really, I think, jump up with the win here. Got any any final thoughts on the uh, Breeders' Cup Classic? Um. If you're going to play, like I said, an exact or a try, just get really skinny with it. I mean, it, unless you think Flyland's going to lose, if you think Flyland's going to 